Grace, mercy, and truth to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? What do you think of when you hear the words living sacrifice? During temple times in Israel, a sacrifice was made of the very best animal. A special animal, perfect in all of its visible attributes. One that had no defects. Only a perfect animal was used as payment to God for the failures, for the sins of man. Only a perfect sacrifice would do. The animal also had to be killed in a specific ritualistic way. So don't misunderstand. In those times, a sacrifice meant death. So a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice must somehow circumvent the dying part. But what does a living sacrifice mean? St. Paul writes in this morning's epistle, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. That would then be the life of a Christian, a life of service, a life of sacrifice. It's not a life lived for your ambitions and goals, but for his ambitions and goals. His preferences and his choices are the ones that should matter. His ways and his will are to be our first concern. And this sort of life may not be fun. It may not be personally rewarding. Paul is saying that your life is expected to be faithful and profitable for the kingdom and for the people among whom God has placed you. In fact, the language of sacrifice immediately alerts us to the fact that this is not expected to be fun, nor is it something that comes naturally to us. What is described here is a wrestling with your life and offering it up as a living sacrifice. It means living your life deliberately for God. It means to set it aside, reserved for God, holy. Living that way isn't supposed to be just for pastors, but for every Christian. Paul called it your spiritual worship. And just as our worship services aren't about what we do, but what God does and gives to us here, our lives are not supposed to be just that free time spent between Sunday services. Our lives should be the reason for genuine worship, the sort of worship, the only sort that God accepts. A living sacrifice is a life that's set on a course, set on a course that's charted towards the goals that aren't mine or yours, but goals charted for the glory of God. Of course, the natural question is, who can possibly do this? Maybe, maybe the first question should be, who really wants to do this? We want comfort. We want to accumulate our stuff. We want to make a name for ourselves, to have fun, to enjoy life. Every generation wrestles with these questions and temptations, but I think very few generations before us have ever had so much to enjoy, have ever had such great comfort and wealth in their everyday lives. It's kind of remarkable that in those times where people had so little that they didn't even need closets, they were able to build hospitals and cathedrals and churches and schools with the, their gifts and their offerings. By our standards, they were incredibly poor, but they were similar to those Macedonian Christians that Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians when he writes, Now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the churches of Macedonia. Out of the most se severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. 
For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints, and they did not do as we had expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Today, it seems not so much Economic conditions certainly have changed, and our expectations have changed. I mean, for example, nurses and doctors aren't going to work serving the community for a couple of chickens and a bag of corn. They can't possibly do that. Especially the way that insurances have changed things and the, and the regulations and the paperwork, right? And, and, and those realities, they make starting or maintaining a hospital, for instance, even more difficult and even more expensive. Right? But on the other hand, very few of us seem to be willing to live sacrificially. We want our nice homes, our cars, our boats, our toys, our good food, lots of new clothes, big closets, and all the other perks of living in 21st century USA. And who has the time? I mean, there just aren't enough hours in the day for what we want to get done. There aren't even enough of us. And we just get tired of giving and doing and going. Believe me, I know, I know the feeling, but it makes me wonder how people in the past who had so much less and for whom the opportunities were so much more restricted how did they get these things done? Maybe they did it by living sacrificially, putting God's stuff first and their own stuff second. To be sure, not everyone did it back then, but there must have been a bunch of them. And, that, and there must have been a bunch who did it. And Paul tells us he knows the nature of the problem. It's our human nature. And that's why he warned us not to be conformed to the world, not to be shaped by its values and attitudes, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Only when faith and our lives in faith are under the power and direction of the Holy Spirit, only then can we have holy desires and do those holy things that demonstrate what the will of God truly is, that demonstrate they demonstrate those things that are good and acceptable and perfect. Christian humility is formed around seeing yourself reflected in the law, which means that we live a life of repentance. It includes an honest understanding of how little we deserve forgiveness and life and salvation and recognizing how tremendous the gift of God's gospel really is. When we speak of the gift of life, we're not just talking about the difference between dead and in a casket and alive and walking around, but we're talking about the difference between hell, agony, and damnation on the one hand, and heaven, eternal life, joy, peace, and glory on the other hand. I mean, I can't conceive the depths of hell. I know it's bad. And I also can't imagine the joys of heaven. But I am assured that it's very, very good. Now, about all that guilt that I was laying on you about living for yourself and not for the gospel, it's true. It's true. It's true of all of us. Even when we're doing well living out our faith, we're realistically living a cold, calculating, self-absorbed life because we're sinners. So thank God that we have a Savior. Part of that thanksgiving is to be living your life as a sacrifice to God. We're the one, we are who we are and where we are by God's plan. The things he's given us to do are things that we can do and that he would have us do. And not all of us can do the same things, that's true. Some can encourage, some 
have money. Some have time. We all have different gifts. The point is that we each have our place and the things that we can do to advance the mission of the church. And that mission is to confess Christ, confess Christ, and spread the gospel. And that means encouraging one another and those who don't yet believe. Can any of us do more than we're doing now? I'll bet we can. We might not want to. It might feel like a burden. It might seem unfair. Our flesh might scream against giving more or doing even one more thing or taking on something new. So when it screams, that's when we know that our lives are being laid on the altar of sacrifice. That's the moment when we need to repent of our desires to be safe without Christ, to repent of our desire to live in service to our flesh instead of to our Lord and our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we do repent, when we see the truth and repent, and then cling to the gospel's grace and the forgiveness that's poured out on us in his absolution through his holy supper, that's when we give thanks with both word and deed for all that God has done for us, all that he's given us, and then we are worshiping our true spiritual service of worship. Humbly, we need to remember that we aren't the center of the church. Christ is. We are here for everyone else. See, the way it's supposed to work is that I take care of you. And then you take care of me. And each of one of you can replace that I in the statement and take care of each other while each other takes care of you. Each way, that way, each one of us has 12, 20, 60 other people in this congregation watching out for us, praying for us, encouraging us, helping us, and supporting us in every way that we need. And we're doing it all with the blessings which the Lord provides to each of us so that we can do. God doesn't bless me only for my benefit, but for yours too. He doesn't make any one of us rich simply for our own pleasure or comfort or advantage, but for his plan and his purpose. He doesn't give you time in your days just to spend it on your pleasures and desires, but also to spend it on his work and his people. He expects us to enjoy his blessings, but not to hoard them. Christian humility involves knowing that the lowest seat in heaven is definitely better than the greatest seat in hell. Christian humility knows that even though you don't deserve it, you've been guaranteed a seat in heaven. In fact, he's built you a mansion. He's granting you life with all the joys of being with the Father and with those you love who loved him. Since you know it's worth anything you can do or give to get what God has simply given to you, and since you know and feel down into your heart that you don't deserve his kindness, you give thanks and worship God by presenting your bodies along with everything else that you possess, a living and holy sacrifice to God. Christian humility is repentance and faith. Or as Martin Luther said, for all of this, it is my duty to thank and praise him, to serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Amen. May the love of God and the love of his Holy Spirit keep you and shelter you from now and forever. Amen.